grace, mercy, and peace, they are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. The sermon this morning is based on the gospel from Matthew chapter 10. Today, we're beginning a new series called Define Christian. And we'll see how Jesus defines Christian. Today, he defines it as a person who loves God above all. If you're familiar with Martin Luther, you know all about October 31st, 1517. On that All Saints' Eve, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses to the door of All Saints' Church. And thus, the Protestant Reformation and the Lutheran Church were begun, right? It does mark the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, but it wasn't intended to be the beginning of a new church. It was intended to be a reformation, a renewal, a return to the way the church once was. At that time, there was just one church in Western Europe. And maybe that sounds like a good thing. We heard Paul lament last week about all the divisions in the Corinthian church. It is a shame that there are so many Christian churches out there and that God's people are divided. But such unity means nothing if God's word is not the unifying factor. The church at that time was not unified so much by pure teaching, but rather through hierarchy and bureaucracy. If you think of it in business terms, each town had their local workers and managers. They were supervised by regional managers. Those regional managers were supervised by super regional managers. And they were all accountable to the quote-unquote CEO of the church. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with having a hierarchical, hierarchical setting or structure like this. We don't have that in our church body, but it's not wrong for it to exist. As long as the unifying factor is still God's word. But the church at that time wasn't concerned so much about God's word as it was about preserving its structure, preserving its system, preserving people's loyalty to that system and to the people at the top. Now you might think that the Reformation was really about indulgences. Isn't that why Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses to the the door of the All Saints Church? No, it wasn't. It was about what those indulgences really represented. A church that at that time had become so corrupt with power that everything it did, everything it said, everything it taught was designed to empower and enrich the church. In a small way then, indulgences, those pieces of paper people paid for to receive pardon for sin, were just a small part of this by making the authority to forgive sins only through the church and not even through Christ directly. But how do you go about reforming an institution with so much power and influence? And not just spiritual influence either, but worldly influence also. The church had the ears of kings and their armies. It had money to throw around. It influenced European and world politics for centuries. It had already incited the killing of heretics. So what could possibly be done? On the scene steps a man named Emperor Charles V. He wasn't a theologian, he was a king. The king of Spain, the lord of the Netherlands, and the holy Roman emperor. Although it's been said there was about the Holy Roman Empire, there was nothing holy about it. It wasn't Roman and it wasn't an empire. It refers to the territories that one day would become Germany. He opposed Martin Luther and some of those other names that are perhaps forgotten by those who are not Lutheran historians like Philip Melanchthon, Justice Jonas, Gregor Brick, and George Spalatin. The reformers, however, were not alone either. They also had political powers on their sides, men like John the Steadfast and Philip of Hesse. And so you've got this mix of theology 
and politics, theologians sparring in debate, princes and dukes getting ready to engage with an emperor, and they're threatening to tear Europe apart. So now set the scene. Augsburg, a town that in modern Germany is kind of in the southern part of the country. Emperor Emperor Charles had called a convention of political leaders there and their theologians. The reason, more earthly than heavenly, it was because the Turks were trying to invade Europe from the south, coming up through Austria. And Charles wanted a united army against them. And he thought that the best way to unite the army is if they all had the same faith. His faith. But the reformers had different plans for this convention. This was their chance to present their faith to the emperor, to try to show them that what they believed was truly based on scripture and not on man-made ideas, to show where they were in agreement with the church, to show where they were not, to show where they agreed with the Bible, but also all the ancient fathers of the church as well. Perhaps they thought that the threat of foreign armies would protect them. Charles needed them more than they needed him. And so on June 25th, 1530, 493 years ago today, these theologians presented the Augsburg Confession to Emperor Charles V. They weren't called Lutherans yet. They were still trying to reform the church, but what they presented was Lutheran doctrine. What the Bible teaches about God, about sin, about Jesus, about justification and salvation, about the word and sacraments, about the church. When you go home this week, you're homework assignment is to read the Augsburg Confession. You can find it online. They wanted the emperor and the leaders of the church to see that they weren't trying to break away to try to start their own church. They weren't trying to introduce heresy. They wanted to return to the scriptures as the only source and norm of doctrine and teaching and life. They wanted to make it clear that people are saved, as Paul said in Romans 10 today, by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of Scripture alone, and not because of any work that they do. At Augsburg, the Lutherans were rejected. And though it wouldn't become completely clear until later, this marked the beginning of the Lutheran church. That's why I said happy birthday earlier. Today is our birthday. We celebrate the men made brave by God's power who stood before emperors and kings and proclaimed the word of truth. By faith, these men obeyed Jesus' words in the gospel today. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So the question is, Are you up for that? Maybe you'll never be called on to defend your faith before kings or emperors or presidents. In fact, it's likely that you won't. One thing that struck me when studying the context of the Augsburg Confession was that the common people weren't really involved. Unless you were a theologian or a politician or a lawyer, you weren't really a part of this. If you were a coal miner or a farmer or a businessman, a mayor, this didn't have a whole lot to do with you. But Jesus isn't talking about something as grandiose as taking a stand before world powers. In fact, he narrows the context and the scope quite a bit. He says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. 
A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Well, shoot. We might not have the guts to stand up to kings and princes. Do we even have the guts to stand up to our own family members and defend our faith before them? But wait a minute, Jesus. What do you mean you didn't come to bring peace to the earth? Didn't the angels sing at your birth, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth on whom his favor rests? But there the angels were speaking about the peace between God and humankind. There they are singing of the peace that fills our hearts from knowing that Jesus has washed all our sins away. But Jesus does bring a sword that divides even families. With this sword, he draws a line in the sand. On one side are those who love him, and on the other are those who reject him. Even in families, father on one side, son on the other, mother on one side, daughter on the other, mother-in-law on one side, daughter-in-law on the other side, and these aren't just the typical tensions that you think of for these family members. Jesus is talking about the tensions that become because of him. Today, my son believes in Jesus. He's written a whole song about Jesus washing his sins away. And if you ask him, he might even sing it for you. He'd lo- I'm sure he'd love to sing it right after church here in front of all of you. But what if 20 years from now, he loses his faith? He thinks dear old dad is stuck in his ways then how my heart would be tempted to fall on the sword, deny the Son of God, so not to lose my relationship with my son. Perhaps you've been on the other side of it. As the child, your parents were not believers. They they themselves had rejected the faith of their parents. And when you came to believe, they sat you down and told you that they thought you were a fool for believing in what they called fairy tales. All your life you've craved your parents' approval. How easy it would be to say, Dad, Mom, you're right. I don't really believe any of it. How many parents have denied God and his word because of their children? How many children have denied God and his word because of their parents? The bond between parents and children is so strong it often resists the sword Jesus brings. But Jesus says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. There's no denying it. God wants to be loved above all. We're not talking about money this time. Jesus has plenty to say about money. This time he's talking about family, about our relationships. He wants you to love him more than any person. He wants you to love him more than life itself, he says. Whoever finds their life will lose it. But where will we find the courage to take a stand? Where can we find the bravery to confess Jesus even if it brings a sword between us and our family? Where can we find the strength of the reformers to proclaim Jesus' name, even if it means we might lose our lives. We find it only in Jesus himself and his promise. He says, whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. He says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. 
we find our hope in the one who stood before the governor, Pontius Pilate, the one who held his life in his hands, who refused to deny even the false accusations against him, who willingly gave up his life for you so that you would live even if the world, the whole world, tries to take your life from you. The Holy Spirit brings us the bravery and the courage and the strength and the words to speak, just as Jesus promised. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. The Spirit comes to us through the Word, through His Word, just as we heard from Romans 10 today. In His Word, He forgives our sins through Jesus. Peter says, or Paul says about this Spirit, that the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. He draws us ever closer to the Father who loved us enough to deny and forsake his own son on the cross so that we would have eternal life. So that this same resurrected son would stand before his father's throne in heaven and confess our names to him that we are his children too. And because Jesus acknowledges us before the father, We have the hope and the courage to confess him here on earth, to hold to the precious truths of Scripture, to carry the crosses that come, even to lose our life here, that we may gain our life there in heaven with God forever. It wasn't long before the Reformers' confession brought more trouble. In only about six or seven years, war broke out because of the differences in religion. And war broke out again and again throughout the 1500s, culminating in the 1600s from 1618 to 1648 with the Thirty Years' War, a war fought on religious lines. In that war, Europe was devastated. The territories of Germany lost 50% of their population. The land of Europe was devastated, destroyed. A Lutheran pastor who lived during that time, during the Thirty Years' War, named Paul Gerhardt, he's a famous hymn writer. Because of the war, he couldn't even become a pastor until after the war ended when he was 44 years old. Finally then, he could marry the love of his life, Anna Maria, together. They had five children. But living in post-war Europe meant struggle. They barely had enough to get by. And then tragedy struck. His wife of 13 years died after a long illness. Four of their five children didn't make it out of childhood. What a sad and bitter life. If anyone was going to deny Jesus, it should have been Paul Gerhardt. But no. He wrote many of the hymns that we sing. O sacred head now wounded, upon the cross extended, a lamb goes uncomplaining forth. Those are maybe some of his best known. One of his lesser known hymns, but perhaps considering his circumstances his best, sings this. Why should cross and trial grieve me? Christ is near with his cheer. Never will he leave me. Who can rob me of the heaven that God's Son for me won when his life was given? When life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. God, my loving Savior, sees them. He who knows all my woes knows how best to end them. God gives me my days of gladness, and I will trust him still when he sends me sadness. 
God is good, his love attends me. Day by day, come what may, guides me and defends me. From God's joy can nothing sever, for I am his dear lamb, he my shepherd ever. I am his because he gave me his own blood for my good, by his death to save me. Since I know God never fails me, in his voice I'll rejoice when when grim death assails me. Trusting in my Savior's merit, safe at last, troubles past, I shall heaven inherit. The cross is heavy. The sword is sharp. But Christ comes to lift our arms. He comes to heal our wounds. And we, we love him above all. Amen.